introduce to you our first speaker, um, Sharia Saxena. Uh, so Sharia did her uh, actually undergrad, undergrad studies here in Lausanne, where I'm based now at EPFL. Um, and um, so it's a double pleasure to, to host her in this session. And she recently started her own lab uh, as an assistant professor at the University of Florida. And I think she will talk about uh, neural strategies that produce flexible movements. Stage is yours, Shreya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fahid. Um, and yes, we have that in common. Uh, we were both at EPFL at some point. You're still there. I'm jealous. I like Lausanne a lot. Um, and I'll get started today. So this is work that I did primarily during my uh, postdoc at Columbia University. Um, thank you all for joining and thank you to Neuromatch for organizing this. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity, especially in times such as these. Um, so I'll, I'll talk today about uh, network principles and, and how they can inform us about um, strategies in the motor cortex. So as a motivation, I want you to take the case where you're practicing a new dance move, let's say. So you first practice it slowly, get the steps right, and then once you have learned it, you can flexibly speed up the movement and make it at the speed that you would like. There are many other movements uh, where this kind of strategy applies. And today I want to address the question of how the motor cortex may be achieving this goal. So to answer that question, a colleague, Abigail Russo at Columbia in March Hirschland's lab trained two monkeys to cycle through a virtual environment while tracking a target. You see the target here on the screen. The target was continuously moving at different speeds. And in addition, the, depending on the color of the landscape, uh, the monkey cycles forwards or backwards to produce the movement. Uh, you may be familiar with a cycling task from Abby's uh, 2018 paper, but in that paper, in fact, the monkey was going at a constant speed. Um, and this is in fact a different data set, one in which the monkey's speed changes continuously. So at the same time, Abby also recorded single unit neuron, neural activity from the motor cortex and intramuscular EMG, so muscle signals. Okay, so we first take a look at the muscle activity. Um, this is the activity of one of the muscles during forward cycling. Um, this is a rhythmic movement. So we chop it up into cycles and this happens to be the slowest movement. Um, and in fact, the fastest movement looks like this for this muscle. And as expected, the duration of the cycle is shorter as you can see, but the pattern of activity changes as well. Um, and similarly, we have all the other speeds in the middle. We bin the activity in, into eight different speeds. And uh, we also have the activity of many other muscles here. I'm just showing one of them, um, but, but there are many other muscles. And in fact, uh, the biggest signals in the muscle activity, that is the top three principal components, look like this. Um, and this, as you can see, is fairly tangled up. Uh, it's quite messy. But our question today is how is this muscle activity generated? So we ask ourselves, how would a model generate this data? or uh, what would a network do? As I like to call it, WWND. So we used a recurrent neural network to simulate the activity with speed as an input. So this is a, this is a hypothesized input that would be coming into the motor cortex. Um, and so now our network itself is a model for the motor cortex since it, uh, since it has the same inputs and the same outputs as that brain region. Uh, okay, so here I am showing you the activity of the trained networks nodes in, uh, in PC space and principal component space for each speed. And this activity seems to follow a quite a clear structure, which in fact looks very different from the EMG structure. This was an example network model, but we fit over a hundred models and I'm showing you four other ones here. And they all seem to have this structure. And there, in fact, seems to be extra signals generated in the network while producing the EMG. And in fact, these signals are important. Um, and how do we know that? We can actually decode the neural signals better using the network activity than if we had just considered the EMG data. So here I'm showing you an example neuron firing rate in white um, and the corresponding fit using the RNN PCs one through three in green. And you can see that the fit is quite good, much better than if we had used the EMG uh, PCs one through three. And it's not true just for this one neuron. In fact, single neurons as a whole are fit much better using the RNN activity as compared to the EMG activity. Okay, so I've hopefully convinced you that the RNN model is a good one. It can output EMG activity. 
That's what you think the motor cortex is doing. It can fit single neuron activity. Um, however, I could have done both of those with a 10 layer deep neural network that would not have helped us gain any insight or any understanding of the computational mechanisms involved in generating this activity. So the last thing we need is in fact interpretability in our model. Why does it act the way it does? What characteristics of the model can we expect to be present in the data? Now the computational mechanisms in the network are fairly straightforward to ascertain since we can simulate it. So for example, here I visualized the flow fields and showing the 2D projection of those. And we see that if we give it this, here I'm giving it the slowest speed input. Um, in fact, we have a locally stable limit cycle. So even if the trajectory uh, was started, has its initial condition somewhere in the vicinity of the trajectory uh, of the limit cycle, it traverses the smooth flow field and ends up at that limit cycle. What about the other inputs? So in fact, as we vary the amplitude of the input, we find ourselves in other limit cycles. So this is from the slowest to the fastest input and correspondingly the limit cycle. So the structure here seems to be an input dependent limit cycle. So that's all well and good for the network, uh, but what can we say about the actual data? So we need features of this activity that we can see in the data, as well as data-driven metrics to quantify the structure. Okay, so what are the features in the model that we should look for in the data? They all seem to have this feature um, of having big circles in the dominant dimensions and a separation between the trajectories. So does the data have these features? And if so, why? So to take you through that, I will first introduce a data-driven metric that we can actually test in the data. And that is a, a metric called trajectory tangling. This is a data-driven way to diagnose a system's robustness to noise and how autonomous the system is. And why are we looking at this metrics? This is so that we can later actually calculate this directly given the data. So here, just to take you through what this is, um, take the state of the system, x at time t, and out of all of the other time points, check which has the largest difference in derivative. Um, but is the closest in state. So here, that happens to be t prime. Basically, it if it has a different derivative, it better be far away in state. Otherwise, it's easy for the trajectory to be knocked over it, to a completely different trajectory. So for example, here I'm showing a very tangled, uh, tangled point. And this is the actual formula that we're using for this metric. Um, and here are some trajectories with points of high tangling. Um, and some others with low tangling. So the important thing here is that this is a completely data-driven metric, as I had said before. And the goal is to characterize a system through only the observed trajectories. So what does this tell us about the motor cortex and the muscles? We believe that the motor cortex has noise robust dynamics and thus that the motor cortex has low tangling. And in fact, the rhythmic trajectory with the lowest tangling is a circle. So that's our first prediction. So here I'm showing you the network activity again, and this gives us a concrete reasoning for the first geometric feature of big circles in the dominant dimensions. Now, if these were the same big circle in high D space, we would have a tangling problem because we would have uh, trajectories which have different derivatives but are very close in state. So we don't think that's happening either. And that leads us to our second geometric feature that these circles are well separated in high dimensional space. So this gives us two concrete predictions for the data. So let's see if these exist in the data. So to check our first prediction, we take the monkey cycling forwards at different speeds. As, and as a comparison point, I'm plotting the muscle trajectory here. So each plot here is in, for the trajectory at one speed and its own PCs. And we see that the muscle activity is changing its pattern very drastically across speeds and has a lot of points of high tangling. Now to compare, we come to the neural activity. And here, no matter the speed, we in fact see a big rotating circle in our data. So that basically uh, shows us that the first prediction that we had made uh, is true in this data. And here, just to see how similar these circles are to one another, just overlaying them all for you. But remember, these are all in their own PCs. So I showed you that the neural data contains big circles in dominant dimensions that contribute to having low tangling per speed. But let me remind you, if these were the same big circles overlaid on top of each other, we would have a tangling problem since this is, this, these would be going at different speeds or different derivatives. So we expect the separation between the trajectories. So 
So let's just check. So here I'm showing you the different trajectories now in a global PC space. The first two PCs follow the same big circular trajectories of the network. But as soon as we get to the third PC, this is when we get to the separation between the trajectories, which is a large one. And uh, we see that in the third PC directly, but we can also uh, check that it does exist in the full neural dimensional space. And here we can directly calculate that. I'm just displaying the Euclidean distance in all dimensions from a reference trajectory as a function of the phase of the cycle theta. And in fact, for every theta, the distance is monotonically increasing as a function of speed. So there is that separation between these trajectories in the neural space. But why is that important? Um, in fact, I'm overlaying this now with the value for tangling in the global uh, PC space. And you can see that the tangling remains very low for neural activity, as opposed to the muscle activity here. There are many points of high tangling. And how do we know that it's the separation that is leading to low tangling? We can actually test that out directly. So here, within, uh, here's the within speed tangling for both muscle and neural data. And here's the 99th percentile of just the neural tangling values. And I'll first just show you how bad the tangling could have been uh, if the trajectories were just overlaid on top of each other. Here we just speed up and slow down the reference trajectory and add biophysical noise. And they are basically directly on top of each other. And we see that the tangling in these simulated trajectories shoots up more than 2x. And in fact, the global, actual global tangling is nowhere near this level. Um, and in fact, it is exactly this separation that is leading to the low trajectory tangling, which we can directly test by artificially removing this separation, in which case the tangling shoots up again. Okay, so with these data manipulation techniques, we can see that there is indeed um, a large separation between the trajectories at different speeds, which is exactly the thing that is leading to low tangling across speeds. Shreya, sorry for interruption. If you could wrap up, would be great. We can have yep. time for questions, thanks. Sounds good. Um, and so I am basically at the end with these uh, two main geometric features, uh, the, both the network data and the neural data make sense. Um, and this all came from what would a network do uh, at WWND. So uh, with that, I want to thank my, uh, I want to acknowledge my co-authors and thank them, Abigail Busso, John Cunningham, and Mark Churchland. Um, and look out for the, for the paper that is uh, forthcoming <laughs> and hope soon on BioArchive. Great, and if you're interested in questions such as these, uh, check out my lab. I have a new lab, as uh, we mentioned. Um, I'm looking for collaborators and PhD students and would love to just talk to anyone who would like to learn more about either this project or any of the other projects that I'm working on. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Ria, for the great talk. Uh, I hope we have time for we have a few minutes for a couple of questions. So I'm gonna go quickly to the questions. So our first question is from uh, Barbara Fulner. And uh, Barbara is asking if, um, could there be missing dimensions from the muscle, like which you did not record from, uh, which makes the EMG trajectories less tangled. Yeah, which, so yeah. Uh, we did record from a large number of muscles in the upper limb, uh, around 30 or so. So uh, we we hope to have captured a lot of the a lot of the variations in the muscle activity. Um, that being said, yes, of course, that's always uh, a possibility. And we did uh, basically we downsampled, let's say, the number of neurons, and, and we kind of made these kinds of um, we we did tests to check things like that to to check that the that the relationship between the neural tangling and the muscle tangling can be um, can be uh, appropriately done. Um, so that, that's something that we did take into account, but thank you. Thank you for and the I answer. I answered another question from <laughs> as well. So. Yes, exactly. So I was about to actually ask more of a, maybe a naive question. I think you showed us uh, a beautiful uh, metrics and showing this robustness to the noise that could be the reason of this uh, low tangling in this dominant uh, dimensional space, let's say dynamical space. But could there be anything also related to the, to the nature of the movement, which is also a cycling movement that could may, have you tried that in like any mm -hmm. non-cycling movement and see if you could find some, again, circles as the dimensions of the neural activity? Yes, exactly. Now that's a great question. And I actually have a backup slide for that, which I'm trying to pull up very quickly. I understand that we're short on time, but uh, just 
humor me. So, so your question is basically, you know, is this motor cortex activity just encoding dynamics? But this is where that uh, so the kind of nuance of the experiment where the monkey was doing both forward cycling and backward cycling, uh, that that kind of so this was more explored in other papers, but it's definitely a valid, you know, uh, definitely a great question. So, so, so basically, the idea is that the neural activity during both forward and backward cycling is actually just going in the same direction, is co-rotating, and that kind of convinces us that this is not just encoding for for um, kinematics, because if they were, if it was, then these would be oppositely rotating or rotating in different directions. Uh, and that's Great answer. the short answer. Um, there, <laughs> it also has been shown, rotations have been shown for other kinds of movements as well. So to answer your direct question, yes. Thank you very much, Ria. Thank, Thank you for you. the great talk and the questions and the audience. So for the interest of time, we have to move to our next speaker.